So welcome, everybody. Yes, that's right. This morning, you have a tale of two Evas. She specializes in blending insights from cognitive and social psychology to better understand the user and the context to develop a mental model of products and tools that result in long-term use. She's also redesigned countless onboarding and sign-up flows to boost long-term retention in health, digital well-being, tech, and more. She comes to us from Ideas 42, where she leveraged behavioral science to improve health and wellness of city employees, decrease bias in hiring and retention, and physically redesigned social service offers to better serve marginalized population, improve census completion, and reform child welfare systems to be more equitable and less harmful to families of color. She also designed diversion programs and probation programs from the lens of human behavior and community needs. And yes, the other Eva, when she is not behavioral sciencing, which is a new verb, she's touring, recording, and playing gigs around the country in her indie rock band. So without any further ado or babble from me, um, let me pass the mic to you, Eva. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining me on this Friday afternoon. Um, couldn't couldn't pass up a Hannah Montana moment because um, I just uh, I love it um, and I, it's actually really a Hannah Montana moment in that I'm not blonde anymore so it's hard to say even who I am but um, great to meet you all um, really excited to be here very excited to talk about onboarding which is a topic that's near and dear to my heart something I've thought a lot about over the past few years. Um, and today I want to share some common pitfalls that most companies face and how to weave learnings from behavioral science into onboarding flows. I will caveat that I could probably fill up five hours of content talking about onboarding, and I sort of did and had to um, <laughs> decrease it down. And so I'm currently working on um, an article about onboarding right now, but I want to just give you some of the top insights about designing onboarding to drive conversion and retention and some of the key principles that I think are most important here. And I'm not able to see the chat right this second. So um, yell at me if there's anything I need to answer. Yeah, I'll monitor it. Um, or I'll just ask you silly questions. Perfect, <laughs> love that. <laughs> all right, so I think we all know what we mean, right? When we say onboarding, but to clarify, I mean the process of guiding and familiarizing new users through a product service or platform. So to get us started, can anyone take Everyone take a couple of seconds and think back to your most recent positive onboarding experience. If you have an all-time positive onboarding experience, if you're that kind of uh, nerd like I am, you can also leverage that. But um, for recency um, bias purposes, just think about your most recent positive experience. And if you could either drop in chat or unmute and say what it is, that would be really helpful. Oh, I can see the chat now. Noom, yes. Great. Already dropping some in here that um, I will reference in this talk. So perfect. Geico. Okay. Good to know that golf resorts are really uh, leveraging um, B-side to make their uh, onboarding flows easy. All right. Some of these I'm familiar with and some of them are not as I am not a golfer. Make it insurance. Okay. Great. So I recently went through the onboarding experience um, to try and rent out a room for Airbnb, even though I wasn't actually doing it. So that would probably be my top choice. Um, so for those that answered, uh, I'm probably gonna pick on you, but I want you to think about what made that such a positive experience. So um, you can drop in the chat your response, or if you don't, I will probably pick on you anyway. So you might want to save yourself the painful experience of me cold calling you and just unmute yourself before I do it. For me, I got, uh, I got a kick out of um, the onboarding process because of all the behavioral hacks that they were using. So super cool. Mm -hmm. See you in action. Great. So building some credibility with the behavioral science explanation around the product. Perfect. Julie, do you want to say why threads worked for you? Oh, sure. They just made it so, you know, easy and frictionless in one step. It was click one thing and your entire um, social footprint moves over and you were in the app. I'm not using it, but it was easy to, it was a great onboarding experience. Great. Yeah, I, I felt I similarly about threads. Um, it looks like Geico uh, removed some friction by reducing barriers which is great, minimal steps. 
Um, spilling, great. Anyone else want to name why an onboarding process they recently went through was so great? Okay, well, these are already excellent. I think we can all go home. These are the ones I was going to name. No, I'm just kidding. Um, I have many more. So many of these things that you mentioned are actually really, um, really great because they are in behaviorally informed choices that are intentionally leveraged to help you better understand the product, how to use it and get you through onboarding with a positive perception for when you'll use this product, except maybe Julie in your case with threads, if you're not currently using it. Um, but unfortunately, despite being the first touch point a user has with a product, many teams either overlook the onboarding process or um, fall prey to a classical econ mindset of if a product is good, people will use it. If I give people all the information about how good it is, they'll review it and be very impressed with my product. I wish that was the case, but as many of you know, information does not drive action. So the goals of most onboarding flows and what most onboarding assumes is that um, more information is better. So we have all these features, we should show the new user how much they can, we can offer them, show them all at once in case they wanna use any of these features. It's hard as product designers not to do this, but um, usually we assume that if we give more information, it will be better. We also assume that the value of the product is obvious, right? So I don't need to benefits because you should know that it'll serve you once you start using it. Um, also, many onboarding flows are sort of like any feature usage is better than none. And so they'll consider it success if we basically get people using any feature at all, not necessarily features that are useful to long-term goals or correlated with engagement and retention. And in terms of KPIs, most onboarding flows assume that um, Short-term conversion is a success. Any conversion at all is a success when really we wanna be thinking about long-term conversion and even if that means um, loss of some short-term churners. So as behavioral scientists, what we know is that information alone does not drive action. So even if you tell everyone all the reasons that a product is great, what features they should use, what will help them, they might never use those features. When given too many choices of features, we also are paralyzed and we tend to procrastinate or avoid uh, making a choice at all. Unless we have a framework, right, for how we're going to use a product, um, we tend not to use it or we use it once and then forget about it. Um, and then also we've talked a lot in, I'm sure these sessions about key behaviors, but we really wanna prioritize designing onboarding to encourage users to complete one behavior that will lead to engagement and long-term retention. So uploading three photos to Tinder, first design in Canva, that's associated with engagement. Um, then and much better than having everybody do every single onboarding task. And this is the most painful one. I know it hurts, but aiming for short-term conversion could be keeping you from retaining the most valuable users who won't churn, right? So onboarding that weeds out people who would churn, but might be better for long-term retention is really important. And I'm sure you all have metrics that look at conversion um, and you may have an onboarding team, but what I really wanna talk about today is the landscape that makes onboarding so important from a B-side lens. So every step of the journey matters, but onboarding is that first point of contact a user has with a product. It's the only step in the process that every user will go through. It's the thing that everyone has to go through in order to use the product. It's also the first opportunity that you have as a company to deliver on the product promise that you made in the marketplace. So the first chance that a customer has to be really excited or really disappointed in what they thought they were getting. And it translates to your product's value proposition. So while every step from upsell to cancellation in a user journey are important, I think that, and I'm biased, but I think that this moment of optimizing and shaping the mental model and how to use the product is really important when it comes to long-term retention. But we have a challenge, right? We are in a context that is very complicated. <laughs> and um, I'll tell you a little bit about what psychologies we're faced up against when it comes to designing products. People are under a ton of time scarcity. So showing value quickly in a world with information overload is necessary. Some research shows that people use apps for just three to seven days at most before deciding if they'll continue. 
in line with information overload, people are bombarded with choice overload. So if you get your foot in the door and someone's trying a product, that's a good sign, but we really need to capture that attention. There's hundreds of products in the marketplace, many of them doing similar things. And so comparing them and having that relativity really raises the stakes. And then finally, ironically, <laughs> is primacy effect. We are most affected by our first impression of a product or service. So that will influence the whole way that we engage with a product. Um, it will influence our perceptions of how useful it is. And we have this difficult, right, and exciting task of designing an onboarding flow that accounts for and designs around these top contexts. So from a behavioral lens, the goal of onboarding is how to shorten the time to value while bu bu building a strong mental model for when and how to use a product. Does that differ at all from what you all perceive to be the main goal of onboarding? Are there other goals that you might have around onboarding? You can drop in chat if you're uh, intimidated to speak out on a Friday afternoon. Eva, I'll just say um, I'm always surprised when I smile during onboarding. This is not probably people's objective, right? But there have been a couple onboard. I'm like, oh, that's creative. That's cute. That's cool. But that's that whole delight factor. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and that can fall under um, shorting, shortening the time to value as well. Yeah, great. Um, and we'll talk a little I, bit about that. I have a right. negative, negative experience. Uh, the onboarding experience for Calm, which I know Kristen did a, a deep dive on, mm -hmm. it was kind of a promise of a trial period, but when you actually get into the app, you realize that there's very few things available in the trial period, right? Mm -hmm. So to your message of, you know, what's promised versus what's delivered, um, they definitely fail in that aspect. Right. Yeah, that's key. And I'm really glad you brought that up because we have, right, this delicate balance of trying to get users invested and show and amplify benefit while also not over-promising what the product can actually use. And so I'll talk a little bit about how to combat that in the next few slides. Um, and Ted is awesome, which love that username. Yes, onboarding a place is a place to use build trust in the user, um, <laughs> both by you know, showing what the product features are and how they can help you through active learning, um, but also some ways of uh, referencing endorsement. And if it's a newer product, like when Noom entered the marketplace, it was a little bit different than existing products. You can think about how social norms and endorsements can help that as well. So you're already asking all the questions that are in the presentation. So I'll just jump into it. I think there's three main strategies to supercharging onboarding. And really, the psychologies underlying these strategies interact well together. But first, we want to shorten the time to value and get users excited, interested, and invested throughout this flow. Next, we really want to build a strong framework of how and why to use this product, as well as a framework for when and how frequently you use this product. And that's really important for continued use. And finally, we really want to take out any and all cognitive burden and friction, keeping users going from this through this process easily. Um, so we know that information overload doesn't work. How do we make this onboarding easy and interactive, um, introducing habits to form regular use, while also um, showing them information that is necessary for them to understand? So first. The strategies that I think are really important in shortening time to value is bringing immediate benefits to the forefront and customizing effectively. So I know customizing and personalization is a um, million dollar word, but we're really just gonna talk about how to do it in a way that frames the most value for your user and really shortens the steps that it takes for them to start gaining value. You all have seen this before. <laughs> it is a, a favorite, right, among behavioral scientists. But there's different types of benefits. And what we found in studying um, decision making is that the most difficult battle when trying to get a user to try a product or even go through the onboarding flow is behaviors where the benefits of taking an action are framed in an abstract in the future. I may or may not get healthier if I start walking at some point in the future. Conversely, when the benefits are concrete, I get to listen to my. <laughs> really silly audiobook. If I take a five minute walk now, I'm much more likely to take that action. 
So even if a product can provide a ton of benefits long-term, like Noom does, right, we need to bring those benefits to the here and now. Um, and I will answer these questions when I <laughs> don't get distracted by the chat. So in thinking about combating present bias, and feel free, um, Ryan, to answer the ones that are easy to answer in the chat too. So if you wanted people to vote, which obviously has a long-term benefit of having a candidate represent you, this is especially, uh, I'm sure, on everybody's mind right now. I've been listening to a lot of NPR and shaking a little bit. Um, it's hard to fit in voting, right, and doesn't have an immediate hedonic benefit, but how might you do this, right? So people can be motivated to overcome procrastination and present bias when they're given immediate rewards like pizza, which I know people will judge our civically engaged um, population for being more motivated to vote by pizza than you know, our civic duty, but that's how we are. That's how humans function, right? So a study that found um, providing free pizza, drinks, and election parties had increased turnout in 3.8 of the percent of precincts compared to those that did not have election parties. And this might seem like, you know, doesn't relate to onboarding, but we can think about how to bring concrete immediate benefits to the forefront in onboarding in a few specific way. So one strategy is to bring the benefits of using the product to the forefront, even if you won't experience them immediately. So within the first few clicks of Headspace, um, we're given a concrete stat, right? That using this product for just 10 days can increase our happiness and happiness is thus brought to the current moment or at least thinking about happiness. So when we're thinking about key user objectives, um, we can basically show immediately in this moment, um, we can basically be like, here's what you need to do to get the outcome that you want, which is also enforcing the mental model of what's required to get um, the benefit that you want. So bringing that value, even if you can't have immediate happiness um, in that moment, is really important to pull to the front so that people will continue to get through the onboarding process so they can actually experience that value. And it was mentioned earlier, but another way to show value up front before users actually experience the value of the product itself is leveraging endorsements from trustworthy sources. So if every Twitter user I follow is starting to retweet a certain article, I'm more likely to check it out. I guess now it's threads, right? This also applies to products you're unfamiliar with. So you can include endorsements in your onboarding flow to help build trust while getting the user integrated into the product. Noom provides right here. So a social norm of how many people are using the product and also trustworthy sources who have discussed the product um, in, you know, different articles and shows to build confidence, confidence and perception of the value. This is especially important for products that are newer or that you're trying to challenge an existing um, understanding of. Another way to shorten the time to value is to personalize the product to the individual, since we know that we value things that we perceive to be made for us. So there's two reasons why customization is so appealing to us. One is because more personalized offers feel more exclusive and we value exclusivity higher. The second is that they save us time by having to figure out what course of action or what thing is best for us. So Chase Bank does this really well by using your existing data to offer yourself personalized um, ways of engaging with the product, which um, you know basically already shows me, okay, based on what I do, you know that this is best for me. So I'm one, not having to figure out what the best thing is for me and two, feeling like you're, you're exclusively targeting me. Noom does this really well by giving you a two month personalized course that has been developed to help meet your needs. So even just saying your two month personalized course sort of gives that endowment effect too, where this is my course. This is, um, you know, already like includes what I input in the survey as well that I wanna lose 10 pounds by July 14th. Um, so pulling what you know about the user can be especially effective when you're trying to um, upgrade them from a free product also to a paid product. And there's a distinction here too between customizing by using what you already know about users and what you know about existing uh, or what you know about a particular user. So the Chase Bank example um, basically knows that you invest a certain way 
But if you don't know much about a user, you want to make it easy to get started in onboarding by leveraging what you already know about users like that user. So if a user is completely new to you and you do not have any information about them or their need cases, you might use responses to mini surveys or pre-populated tasks based on how similar others use the product. And in this way, you can use data about how users are engaging with the product to create a customized experience. This will be the first of many Airtable um, examples I use because I just think that they're wonderful and have a very thoughtful onboarding flow. But Airtable basically uses your responses about how you want to use this product to get you started with common tasks that product managers would include, making me feel like Airtable knows my needs. Oops, sorry. Um, in a similar vein, users tend to value products more when they feel like they've contributed it to it in a certain way. So the IKEA effect comes about from an experiment where participants were willing to pay significantly more for IKEA storage boxes they built than for an identical one built by someone else. I'm sure you know about this study. Um, this would not work for me. I hate manual labor. I would pay anyone else to do it. But <laughs> this effect showed that people place a lot more value on their own creations, even for mundane products that are not fun to build. So we can apply the same strategy in product onboarding, and it can be as small as using someone's name. But um, for example, Snapchat Premium allows users in this onboarding flow to create and build avatar avatars that look like them, making the app feel both personal and also like I've invested my energy into creating this experience. So when we're designing our onboarding flows to illustrate immediate value instead of long-term abstract value, we should ask ourselves, how can I make the longer term value feel more immediate? Um, so what's the immediate value to using this product? If there is none, is there one that I can reference? The long term value, can I bring it to the forefront? And what are others saying about this product that can help the user see the value before they experience it themselves? And in terms of customizing effectively, ask yourself, what do you know about the type of user and how they might typically use this product to only include relevant information about what might serve them? So we brought the immediate value to the forefront. We want to build a strong framework through the onboarding flow of how and why this product will meet the needs of its users. And there's a lot of overlap here too, because in building a mental model, you want to build the value um, perception as well. The best way to build this mental model is to set clear expectations of what I will get from this product, what I need to do to get that, and show me how the product will work for me as I'm being onboarded through adapting to my needs, not giving me things that I don't need. So you all know about mental models, but I will say too that um, this is the difference. This is the crux for me of onboarding. This is the difference between a short-term user who churns and a long-term user. We build mental models about every situation and our experiences build upon past experiences. So my past healthcare plan will inform what I expect and look for in my new healthcare plan. But sometimes our mental models are incorrect and at the very least can be over generalizations. So it's really important um, to adjust mental models that are incorrect, and they can also dictate our experience or expectations of a product or service. And uh, Sharon, the difference between a mental model and expectation is that a mental model is more of a network of both, both expectations, experiences, um, perceptions, but also um, sort of a framework that operates beyond just like, I expect this to be like XYZ product, it actually like is a cognitive framework that influences the way that we act and respond. Um, it includes expectations, like our expectations can be informed by our mental model, if that makes sense. So the onboarding process is exciting because it is the first time we actually have control over forming a mental model of how our product works. The promotion and sign up processes may have influenced what people expect, but here we can combat assumptions about the product while building expectations and understanding. And John, related to your um, negative experience with onboarding, right? Like this is a moment that we also want to make sure we're not setting expectations that aren't going to be met in our product. 
I think you all know this example, but I love it so much because basic framing and language can really impact behavior. So Google AdWords, right? People drop off and using it because they are putting all this investment into having an ad strategy. They're not seeing immediate results. They give up on this platform. The mental model they had, right, was that as soon as I set up Google ads, I will get the outcomes I want. And as a musician who's used meta ads for some tours and stuff, I can attest also that because of this study, I did not look for results <laughs> right away because of it. And so it actually helped my own mental model of how these things work. But what we did is we basically showed half the people who received a plan, um, my three month ad words, suggesting that it'll take three months to get results. And half um, we did not show that to. And basically what happened I'm sure you all um, know, but what happened to retention? I'll venture to guess that retention went up for the folks who had the expectation that it would take three months. All right, that is a great expect. Uh, that's a great guess, and you are correct. There was a fourteen percent increase in retention. So just changing the name of the plan led to a fourteen percent increase in retention. Users now expected to see results within three months, so they continued to use the product in that amount of time, not giving up too early. How can we do this in onboarding? One way to do this is to make it really clear what outcomes you can expect to see from your product and make sure to explain where you are getting that estimate, right? So Airbnb does this in a compelling way, giving a seven night um, estimate of what you could earn with Airbnb, both setting a mental model of what you can earn by renting out an apartment, but also bringing benefits that are far off in the future closer. Um, you also obviously want to be really careful about this because you have to show an estimate that will get people hooked, but also not overpromise what you might actually be able to provide. My apartment would definitely not get this <laughs> for two, two ten a night. Just as important as showing us what you can expect to gain is showing the timeline required. So I wouldn't immediately expect that as soon as I sign up for Airbnb, I'm going to start making thousands of dollars. But what I can do is set a clear expectation of the time required to see change and what is expected of me to do that. So Noom does this really well, right? It has a behavioral explanation of why it's going to work better than things that you've already tried. Um, and then also how long it will take. So from month one to month six, you see this clear timeline of what will happen to your weight if you use Noom. And also um, a social norm of showing um, that th this is actually data from the participants who used Noom. So this social norm of proof that others are meeting their goal using the product, but also showing me that I'm not going to step on a scale and lose 10 pounds by tomorrow. Another way to build this model that the product is meant for your particular user going through the onboarding flow is with questions or micro surveys you ask trying to help guide them into using your product, right? So by providing options of the types of teams you could be on in Airtable, Airtable is setting the mental model that this product is intended for people in marketing, HR and legal, product and design, creative production. So you're sending a message that this is an adaptable, flexible product that can meet the needs of any of these types of fields. Not only that, but it's also showing you that this is intended to be a collaborative tool. So you are intended to be able to use this with different teams and you're intended to be able to basically be in any of these type of um, domains and still gain value from it, which is really Airtable's big value add is that it's supposed to cut out all the middlemen. So building a mental model of your product and onboarding includes clarifying the outcomes you can expect, what timeline it takes to get there, who the product is appropriate for, but importantly, we also want to show how the product works. So you would have a very different onboarding for something like TurboTax versus Duolingo in terms of how often to use it, but the messaging makes it clear how often you're expected to use it to be able to see results. Duolingo uses their onboarding flow to set a clear mental model of how many minutes a day users should be practicing to become fluent speakers and prompts to set them um, on clear goals. So providing pre-made options also shapes a model for how others use Duolingo. If you use it for five minutes a day, you're a casual user. If you use it for 20 minutes a day, you're an insane user. 
And so you're both building a mental model of how to use the app while also getting you to set a goal in a pre-commitment type of way, while also giving a sense of how others are using it. So that works for more straightforward products, right? Like Duolingo or Airbnb that we may have an existing mental model of and have a clear key behavior. But how do we build frameworks for products people have less familiarity around? One thing we know about humans is that we tend to avoid things that are ambiguous. So for products that might have some underlying uncertainty and or hesitation from users because of not being sure if they need the product, like in finding an online therapist or even in, in getting a financial advisor, um, for someone who's never been to therapy, it can be helpful to be transparent about the types of things a therapist does or the types of things to expect from a product. In this example, BetterHelp provides a detailed list of what a therapist might do to reduce the uncertainty about what this involves. So BetterHelp asks in their onboarding flow, what are your expectations for a therapist to personalize the experience? Um, and by laying out these options, they're not only segmenting users and showing uh, users what types of things BetterHelp can support with, but they're building a framework for what online therapy entails, especially for someone who might be like, I don't need therapy. This approach is really important to think about for products that might be more unfamiliar to users or for products that have any kind of avoidance and hesitation involved in them. Even ones like dating apps where sending that first message can cause some hesitation. These are all strategies to set really clear expectations for who uses the product and what we expect to get out of a product. But we also wanna provide space for a user to have some agency in how we use the product. So, it can be tempting to default users into an onboarding flow into a certain way of using a product that we think is best for them. But the issue with that is that we have a lengthy and tedious onboarding process while limiting the agency users have to choose the best way to use that product. And so the best way to control for that is providing an empty state, which is, and this doesn't apply for all onboarding flows, but it can be really useful for self-serve element um, products. And it's basically a better context for providing learning cues on how to use a product so that users can get started right away instead of having a lengthy passive onboarding process. And the goal of it is really to bring the value um, to the user sooner. I'll note that you don't wanna just drop users into an empty state at the beginning of the flow, but Airtable does this well by starting with an empty homepage after you've answered some questions about how you might use it. And you can do two things. You can create some space in the long and involved onboarding process, so not burning folks out when they've already given you some answers. You can show that there's multiple ways to create workspaces and choose the one that's best for you. Um, and you can also basically drive action more quickly than having them answer all these questions and then be shown an informational video about how to use something. Instead, they can just start, right? Start from scratch, quickly upload. Another thing I think they're doing well here is. Um, having this little information thing at the top that says invite your friends and coworkers, incentivizing people to collaborate with this tool because they know that leads to long-term engagement. And at the bottom, there's sort of an error message here of nothing's been shared with you. Um, and the what they're doing there is reinforcing the mental model that this is intended to be a collaborative um, product. I know that I use Airtable as an example a lot, but this is a company that has invested, I think they invested 12 to 18 months revamping their onboarding and saw something like a 20% increase in uh, conversion and increases in long-term retention, which is just to say that actually spending a lot of time thinking about this, even when the product is really good, um, can really pay off. Another way to encourage active learning instead of passively teaching is by only offering user guidance at the exact time users need to use it, which is basically um, also considered an action-driven tooltip. So a lengthy onboarding flow showing all the ways you can use Slack would be skipped through, but starting with an empty Slack window after you've welcomed users and having a pop-up that basically says, here's where you would start sending messages uh, and then pre-populating also like what they might say, that can be really helpful in getting um, people to drive action for what will be the most useful part of this product, right? So when building an onboarding flow or improving it, you really want to abandon what you know about the product and all the things that you think could be helpful to someone if they were to be the ideal rational user and ask yourself, 
what will someone who doesn't know my product find valuable? What will the average user in the marketplace find useful about my product? And how do I lead with that? How long will it take to get value from that product? And how do I show that early on? So trying to delete in your brain all the parts of your product that you're designing that you know are useful and just think about, okay, for the user in the marketplace right now, what things are most valuable? And then to encourage active use and help them build the best use case for it, what questions do I ask to reinforce that I know the user? How can I show them that I know what they need and then ask that in these micro surveys? How can I create space to let a user start engaging with the product instead of overwhelming them with information? And how can I adapt to use cases instead of showing all the features at once? And I'll take a breath and um, see if there's any questions right this second. I have uh, one more um, small section that I think is going to be really exciting, but I just want to see if there's anything that folks are coming to mind, if there's certain products you're thinking of when I'm talking about these things, any horrible onboarding flows that have now come to mind. You did just tease that third section, like everybody's now looking ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, too bad you don't have the access to the deck. Oh my gosh. Well, there is a note in the chat for you there, Eva. Great. What about when your product service is something most of your users don't want to use and whose buyer is different from the user? HR department of a company and insurance that offers primary and secondary care. Yeah, can you say more about this? Yes, I work on an insurance company. We offer primary and secondary care, but and our focus is B2B. Uh, the buyer of the products are HR department of the company or founders, directors. Mm -hmm. And the users uh, are different from the buyers. So they are not uh, buying the product by themselves and they don't always see the value of using it. Um, although we offer uh, primary care, telemedicine and so on. So my question is what to do in these cases? Because... Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and a lot of products and services um, won't be direct to consumer, right, that we're talking about, but all of these things also apply. So when you're thinking about building a mental model, how do you figure out what is most important and salient to the people that you are going to be trying to get to use this product or service? And how do you bring those things to the forefront? So the things that you would try to elevate if it was going direct to consumer are very different than if it's not um, that journey, right? So you would basically try and build a framework for what do they want to know about how this will make their life simpler? How do I endorse those claims by actually showing that this value is true? Um, and how do I basically make this flow show that even from the beginning, you're going to be able to make your life easier and um, have value from this product for the goals that you have. So a lot of the examples I'm using are obviously, you know, consumer oriented, but those same questions would apply. Thank you. Yeah. Products that are very past the bar CPA. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so a lot of the questions in the chat, which we'll get to a little bit later too, is about um, less fun products, right? How do we make it easier to, um, yeah, like engage users for less fun products? So I think maybe the removing friction and reducing cognitive overload are going to be two key parts of that. So I'll keep moving on. And then if we continue to have questions, we can talk through them. And I'll leave some time at the end as well. So we want to minimize cognitive burden and friction. Um, it might not be hard to sign up for a dating app or for Duolingo because those are exciting things. Um, but how, when we are asking people to sign up for something that might be more difficult, how do we reduce um, the information given and how do we make it interactive and build habits for regular use, even for something that's more difficult? The first, and I know this is gonna be painful, is to remove all steps, pieces of information that are not necessary to get started with and gain value. So if you're a product designer, this will be painful. You can keep a prototype of that onboarding flow that tells you tell some perfect rational user all the things that the product can do for them in great detail and look at it 
to comfort yourself. But I suggest that you only do that for yourself and that you keep it private. <laughs> um, because what we want people to do, especially for harder services or things that are more difficult, is help people persist through the flow feel positively about the experience as positively as they can, right? I've never had a great time doing my TurboTax, but as positively as I can and get excited about using the product. So the most straightforward strategy is to take out any information that isn't needed. So enabling instant sign up, having a code to log in to get back in the app, not collecting in information that isn't needed, not showing what premium can do for a user before they get situated into basic, um, not showing information that might not be relevant, anything that you can do that basically eliminates unnecessary steps or information. This will lower the burden of what you're requesting from users and allow them to get to the product more quickly. You can always ask for additional information if needed when introducing new features. Um, and here's just a couple examples uh, with Headspace and BetterHelp. Um, but you can think of many others. And when designing, you want to ask what the bare minimum you need from a user is to get started for them to gain value from the app. And when it comes to products that are more difficult or um, a heavier burden, you might think too about how to reframe what you can get, right? What value you can get um, by either saving time for people in the future? How do you bring the immediacy of sort of health benefits to the forefront? How do you think about more creative ways of sort of bringing, um, bringing the benefits of using a more difficult product or service to the forefront when it can be difficult to get through those first steps? Another shortcut that both supports mental models of a product fitting perfectly into your life, but also um, fitting with every tool that you have, is how can we integrate existing tools and existing data? So basically, Airtable offers data integrations with most commonly used tools, Google Sheets, Excel, um, gives you options, but also integrates with Slack, iCal, and other tools for workflows. Um, but the long-term success of a product really like this is how easy it is to transition over to it and use it in tandem with existing products. TurboTax also does this really easily. You can just upload your W-2s. So the benefit of having data in those other products is that we can pre-populate as well. So um, Julie already mentioned this. I experienced that too. But when I was signing up for threads, I was like, I don't know about this, but I'm going to give it a try. And I don't know if anyone else has a like, total paralysis of trying to pick a cool username, but if it's pre-populated and I don't have to worry about it, I'm going to just sign up for it. <laughs> Thankfully, Threads knows this. They import data from Instagram and set up um, profile pick, bio, contact lists. These are some of the steps that some of us overthink. It makes it easier. It makes it integrate in, into the world, our working world and our personal world a lot um, more quickly. The biggest friction of them all is actually um, the sign-up process where I have to potentially pull out a credit card. So my favorite approach to removing friction for products um, is actually deferring the painful step. If you have a product that is not particularly enjoyable, you might not apply this, but deferred account creation, also known as gradual engagement, basically shows value um, and interest before you actually have to sign up. So Duolingo allows you to try out their product before signing up. Only once a user has completed that first language lesson will they be asked to sign up or create a profile, as well as making a small commitment, choosing a brief learning goal. So this also um, allows for pre-commitment, right? If I set a learning goal and I've just figured out what it's like to use this product, I'm more likely to go through with the sign-up process. And in this way, Duolingo... Um, allows users to engage with an app gradually without having, with like the larger goal of learning a language and not with the frustrating obstacle of achieving value. And it saw a 20% increase in daily active users when applied to um, just moving that screen back a few steps. When it's not possible to engage with the product quickly, like being an Airbnb host, um, and this also applies to lengthier processes, a huge way to reduce cognitive overload is by letting people know what's going to be expected. So outlining what will be expected up front, what the process will entail, providing some sense of pro progress of how closer the user is to being done. Um, also framing for what it's worth that certain parts of this process might be easy. So it's easy to get started. 
Um, Airbnb does this well in showing exactly what I'm going to need to do to be able to be an Airbnb host um, and allows me the option to save and exit if I need to start, but then I have to stop to get relevant information, which generally helps too with things like um, insurance or health products. So to keep the momentum going, you can also think about incorporating little random gifts or incentives, even if it's just using the user's name. Thanks, Eva. You got this. Things like that. Or making little jokes. Tinder does this well. Um, I think it has something in their flow about um, like where do you, yeah, like some joke around where you live when you're trying to ask about people's location. Anything that helps kind of soften the blow when you're asking for uh, sensitive information helps too. And limiting the choices from being overwhelming um, can really help, but simplifying them is also really effective. So TurboTax does a great job of removing irrelevant options from the complicated process. And for those of you that are talking about prog processes that have more complicated uh, information, when filling out a tax return by hand, it's impossible to know which sections are relevant to me in my situation. But if you can ask a few simple questions and segment up front about a person's situation, you're able to eliminate a significant portion of the tax filing process that's irrelevant. So this reduction in choice helps keep users from feeling overwhelmed by a complex process. Also having them screen by screen really helps, um, but also helps to sort of not ask me questions that are not going to be relevant to my situation. So in thinking about your onboarding, think about what applies to each user as you segment them and only ask questions that would be seen as relevant to them. So you can provide some options of see more information or this doesn't apply to me. But for the most part, for example, if I'm a basic LinkedIn user looking for a job, I don't need to be shown features or asked questions about helping me recruit a team. Based on how users engage with the app later on or the product, you can always show them more complicated features and ask more questions. Um, so circling back a little bit too to amplifying benefits and bringing them closer, this is also really helpful for an involved onboarding flow where you're asking a lot from the user without giving them a ton back. Uh, but this is a good way to basically practice reciprocity. So giving some information along the way, showing how you are using people's inputs um, can help keep momentum and spark curiosity for more info. For example, Cerebral shows how what they're learning about you through all of these questions, probably sensitive questions, um, will basically impact the product being delivered, which also encourages me to give a thorough and honest answer. This could also work for... Um, Anything like if you're basically having a, like a software audit or if you are trying to like do a financial assessment, things that are like more painful, if you're giving something back when you're asking for things, that can really help keep momentum and show, oh, I'm actually gaining value from this without having to like just dump all my information to you and not get anything in return. Another way to show progress and keep momentum is through checklists and onboarding tasks being striked out as you go. So completion bias, we're motivated to finish steps. We want to get to the end. Take advantage of that bias by making unfinished steps really salient. Other ways to handle more complicated onboarding flows that require a lot of user response or include a lot of information is to break it down into multiple screens or suggest common responses or even provide multiple choice answers instead of the open text field. The main takeaway here is that we want to balance providing enough info and asking what we need to segment users into a positive experience while keeping momentum up. So when designing this flow, especially if it's a more involved product or service, what steps are absolutely necessary for the user to start gaining value from the product or to perceive value from the product if you're not going to get it immediately? How can I break down um, a heavy process um, into multiple steps? How can I replace information heavy in, uh, flows with more interactive actions? And how can I set expectations for longer processes? Um, I will say that the most important area to remove friction is in the key behavior. So if you know that performing certain actions increases a user's likelihood of success, inviting friends to a messaging app, scheduling your first appointment in ZocDoc, you should aim to help them complete these meaningful actions as soon as possible. So I 
um, wanted to get, leave a little bit of time at the end and I see the chat is active, but I wanted to one, thank you for spending your time with me today, letting me share just a small snippet of what I could spend hours talking about, which is everything related to onboarding. Um, and I, I will probably be writing um, some articles about this as well. So hopefully if you look out on your listserv, you'll see something around that. Um, but I wanted to see, yeah, can I answer any questions? I know that was a lot of information. So um, any reflections on one, things that seemed particularly useful or any information that people wanna um, dig into a little bit more that we can in the next few minutes. Just, just really quickly, um, Jason Parker clearly just took a chug of Gatorade. He's like, woo, that was a lot of learning today. Um, so that was incredible. Before we actually go to questions, Eva, I wanna do this really quickly in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. If everybody could just write down your biggest takeaway from the presentation, if you could just, what the story you remember, example you remember, and the reason I'm asking this is because I think it will help uh, Eva as she develops this into a blog to, kind of see what was most salient or most useful for you. So if you just take a second to uh, tell us what brain candy you received today. Oh, these are fun. Um, I'm gonna just read them because that gives me joy and pleasure. Are you all ready? Onboarding is a deliberate, thoughtful process. Creating mental with <laughs> mental model with onboarding, unfortunately never occurred to me. Um, if you didn't check that day one blog, it is uh, excellent, Scott. I, I'll repaste it when we kind of finish up. Uh, let's see. How do you reduce that time to value? Setting exp expect oh, it's going too fast. Oh, and Shay even shared something. Don't give info, drive action, blew my mind. Thank you, Maho, we, we'd love to hear that. That's probably the, the subtitle of your, your blog, Eva. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Bjorn, always dropping knowledge, feeling uncertain can cause inaction, then negative outcomes even. Megan, don't forget about humor, little gifts along the way. Molly says prioritize long-term usage um, versus those who will churn. As always, reduce friction. That's right, Lynn. <laughs> it's like you're paying attention. <laughs> Ditto to Molly. <laughs> Ted, uh, you're awesome, though. You, you'd think you'd, you'd do better than a ditto. I'm just saying no pressure. <laughs> um, no, that's excellent. Those are very, very helpful. Um, please keep dropping those in the chat. Uh, that said, anybody have any questions for our last five minutes, please feel free to just kind of raise your hand. We'll do it that way today. Um, raise your hand and jump into the discussion. I should say raise your virtual Zoom hand, which is a separate kind of Simpson-y type hand. Oh, I see a hand. I see a Simpson-y hand. Where is it? Ah, so is it Metro? I do. No, I was close. Well, <laughs> where where are you? And share your question. I'm I'm in Colombia, in Latin America, um, and uh, well, my question is well related to to this problem that we usually have uh, designing onboarding and not including all the information in in in, in this process. This usually gets to a struggle with the business and marketing areas. So mm -hmm. I, I was wondering if, if you have any recommendation about how to turn them over, not to overshow all the portfolio in the onboarding. Is the question like how to persuade the business and marketing? Exactly. Yeah. It's a great question. And, you know, we struggled with this as behavioral scientists to be like, listen, I promise you that information is not going to work here. Um, but I think, you know, there's, and, I, and I'm happy if you email me that after this, I can send you some um, research on this as well. But I think basically um, showing the evidence of information alone does not drive action, but making a case for what the most um, important information to show is and explaining why that is from a user journey perspective. So not thinking about what users say in terms of 
like, yes, this information would be helpful, but actually looking at are the information pages having more drop off compared to the ones where people are inputting information, comparing to more inter interactive steps. And if you can show that from a data perspective, when you already have sort of the academic um, argument in your back pocket, I think that can be really useful while also um, including information that business and marketing care about, right? So that you might not include all of it, but when you better understand what users want to see and what's compelling um, to pull them in, or at least to, to make them understand how to use a certain service, um, it's a lot less than you would usually think. Um, but persuasion, we didn't cover in this deck. I'm sure we will have a membership talk on persuasion one day, <laughs> but uh, generally those are those would be the things that I would focus on as um, showing them in the user journey why information isn't working and really understand what things are sort of um, most important for the user to understand to be able to gain value from the product. Sounds great. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Great to have a voice from Colombia this morning. Um, so, uh, Asli, uh, you want to ask your question to wrap us up today? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I was wondering, we, we talked too much about the onboarding on the product, like within the product. I was wondering where exactly put the marketing efforts, like the communications on different platforms within this onboarding pers perspective. Right. So how to apply these same strategies to like upsell and marketing and sign up before getting into onboarding? Yeah, I mean, before before the users come into our product, they kind of hear about us from our different marketing efforts and stuff. So that's kind of where they not exactly meet us, but hear about us. So, I mean, that kind of is the maybe a, either step zero or a minus one for the onboarding. So, like, how exactly should we think about it and, like, start implement those efforts pro at those areas too yeah yeah Th this is it, it could be a much longer answer so i'm going to try to keep us in the one minute range of this but i will basically say that onboarding and and marketing teams should be in communication about how what you're framing as the value add is shown and reinforced through the onboarding flow um and beyond that yeah, I, I think that's the short answer is basically those two teams should really be in conversation and the whole user journey should be looked at beyond just the onboarding process. So even if there's a specific onboarding team looking at that flow, it should also include like what are all the ways that someone gets to this flow and how will that predict and affect the way that they engage with the information in the onboarding flow. Wow, thank you so much, Eva. This is great. I, I want you to know how great it was. Sharon is one of our Rational Lab super fans. And uh, I will read this out loud. She said, content was great. Communication was super clear. And cadence was just right. Top 10% webinar. Thanks. Have to run. So that is from Sharon in Seattle. And on that wonderful note, um, if we could all give Eva a virtual or real loud uh, actual round of applause. Thank you so much for your insights. As always, this recording will drop um, in the top of the hashtag of, oh, I, I heard real claps, I love it, in the top of the events channel. Um, we hope that you'll join us next week. If you have any follow-up questions, I did put Eva's email in the chat. Additionally, as always, should any of you want to collaborate with us beyond membership and bootcamp, um, we're always interested in taking calls about engaging with you on consulting. So feel free to reach out to any of us at the Irrational Labs team. Um, that said, go forth, have a brilliant weekend, stay out of trouble, and uh, you know, tell someone that you love them. All right. Have a great weekend, everybody. Take Thanks, care. Everyone. Have a great weekend.